So, this is a video about um, writing extended Berkeley packet filter bytecode by hand and why I'm doing that to some extent. So, uh, I work on the Linux test project where um, we have a bunch of tests for the Linux kernel, unsurprisingly, and these run and are in a separate repository to the Linux kernel itself. Um, recently, we decided to start looking at uh, eBPF testing because there's been a few um, bugs surrounding that, especially surrounding the eBPF verifier and uh, some high profile side channel attacks, which can be performed with eBPF, um, such as Spectre. There's probably other speculative attacks as well, which can be performed. Um, there's already extensive tests available for um, BPF in the Linux kernel. Um, the only issue with the self-tests is that they're quite difficult to run um, with uh, an alternative kernel. So if you want to run the newest tests, you might have some trouble running that with an older kernel where you have backported patches. Um, but of course, we don't want to try uh, competing with the self-tests. So we're just looking at the most high impact bugs and trying to recreate some regression tests for them. So we want to create reproducers for those high impact bugs. Um, and we want to do it with as few dependencies as possible. So uh, when someone compiles the Linux test project, even if they're missing a bunch of dependencies for BPF, which you may not even know what BPF is. I think most people don't know what BPF is or what it's used for. Um, even if they're missing all that, they'll still get these tests, which has led me down the path of uh, doing some insane things, which is what this video is about. Okay, so currently you can see the um, kernel documentation. Uh, this is in Linux documentation networking. And as you may guess from the name, uh, Berkeley Packet Filter, BPF was originally invented for filtering packets. It's used by the Linux kernel to filter packets as low down the networking stack as possible. So that means filtering those packets inside the kernel. And it's used to do that in a very flexible way. Um, the type of BPF I'm exploring is actually extended BPF. Um, however, there's a historical BPF, which is incidentally what's used in SecComp, if you've ever come across it in that context. So eBPF is used for packet filtering and a load of fancy stuff involving debugging and tracing. Um, the debugging and tracing stuff is only allowable when the user has uh, the admin capability. So basically if they're root. Um, so we're not too interested in that type of thing. There's some pretty amazing stuff you can do with eBPF um, for debugging and tracing. and I'd recommend checking that out. Uh, it's really quite amazing what people can do now. The tools are quite complex though. So, let's look at some code. So this is a test in the Linux test project. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Linux test project, lucky you. Each test in the Linux test project is uh, a standalone program. So each test is compiled to a separate executable. There's a shared Linux test project library, which allows us to write code that looks a little bit more sane. 
uh, each test has this test structure and we specify a function for setup and a function for run and stuff like that. Um, this at the bottom is where we specify some uh, buffer objects which uh, was recently introduced by Metan and that allows us to use guarded buffers. And you have some functions like safe close, which um, basically contain some macros and stuff so that um, basically saves you a lot of error correction code and stuff like that, uh, like safe socket pair. It creates a socket pair. Um, and at the same time, if it fails to create that socket pair, then we'll get a nice error message stating where that happened and so on and so forth. So the Linux kernel, uh, Linux kernel, the Linux test project provides a lot of nice um, functionality in its test library. So back to the matter at hand. Um, this is one of the tests I've written. Uh, it's really the simplest test that I could come up with. It probably serves no purpose except to show that, you know, your kernel's not completely broken. So it doesn't really do much useful. It's more just um, a basic smoke test. If this fails, you have serious problems with your kernel. So, at the top here, we have the bytecode, which we will start to explore in a moment. Um, going back to the, the actual definition of BPF, in case you don't know, uh, a BPF program is made up of um, instructions like um, assembly or machine instructions. Uh, but these instructions are defined for a virtual machine. So there's no actual computer anywhere that will process um, these instructions. They have to be um, either interpreted or converted to native instructions. The Linux kernel can do both. Uh, most of the time it converts them to native instructions. So BPF code will run very quickly within the kernel. OK, so we just put all of those instructions in the little array and then. So we have our array of instructions and we need to pass those to the kernel, which we do with the BPF system call. So this system call. Oops. Where is the one that actually loads the code? Ah, it's up here. <laughs> OK, so the BPF system call has a number of different commands we can pass to it, like BPF prog load. And this allows us to do things with BPF. In this case, load the program into the kernel, and the kernel will verify that program is correct and then you are passed a file descriptor which is um, somewhere around here anyway it passes us back a file descriptor and then we can attach that file script uh, descriptor to a socket which is what we do here and then when uh, a packet is passed through that socket um, the BPF program will be run and it will be passed um, a socket buffer which describes that packet. Um, there's some other BPF commands you can use as well. Um, there's the BPF map create which allows us to create a shared array or a sh shared uh, dictionary or hash map which allows us to, within our BPF program, we can add entries to that map. And in user land, we can load entries from that map. So it basically provides a communication channel between the kernel and user land, which 
doesn't require, well, yeah, sorry, it does require making a system call. But anyway, that's okay. So then, this is the BPF bytecode. Well, what it actually is, is a bunch of C macros. So, in theory, you could write a program with almost no dependencies. However, you will need to maybe use some helpers. So, what I have done is I have copy and pasted a bunch of header code from the kernel. And this header code includes definitions uh, for the types of BPF instruction. And I've just copy and pasted this into the LTP. Of course, we could um, just specify this header code as a dependency for the LTP, but then we have to rely on the correct kernel headers being present in user land when someone's compiling the LTP. So I've just um, copied it in or vendored it to use uh, Google terminology. I've vendored in those headers into the LTP. So if we scroll down a bit, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. So these macros here, these um, allow us to more easily write the BPF instructions. Uh, each instruction is represented by a C structure and um, each structure has a number of different fields. The first one uh, tells the kernel what type of instruction it is uh, and this is a bit field and you can see here that a bunch of different values have been ORed together to create the um, code. And then we have the destination register and the source register and two fields which are used um, in some instructions and not others. This is the uh, first one is the offset and the second one is the immediate. Uh, the immediate is used to store constant values within the instruction itself. Um, so you can load an, uh, an instruction, so you can load a value into a register by including that value inside of the immediate, if it fits inside the immediate. Um, and of course, like uh, a normal CPU, you have registers um, and you have a stack and you can add and remove data from the stack and the registers. Much like a normal CPU, but a lot simpler than most CPUs, even very simple CPUs. Okay, so going back to the code. So yes, this is just a static array. And at the top here, we have the BPF load map file descriptor macro. And if we look at this, um, you can see this macro expands to another macro, which is probably just above it, yep. And this macro actually extends into two separate instructions. Um, because the file descriptor is 64 bits long, I think. So the immediate uh, is not large enough to store the entire fi file descriptor, at least in theory. So we actually need two instructions with the first instruction containing the first part of the immediate and information about which uh, code we want to use in the destination registers and source register. And then the second one has the uh, high bits of the file descriptor. So this one loads um, the maps file descriptor into a register. It's actually just a placeholder because we need we get the file descriptor at runtime and this is just a static array. So this array is essentially a template 
and we at runtime want to replace uh, zero with the actual value of the file descriptor. I've just put um, this as a constant array up here because it's convenient in uh, C to do that. Okay, and then we have um, an instruction which just moves um, the uh, stack pointer or frame stack frame pointer into a register. So if we go up here, look at what all the registers mean. So registers zero to 10 are registers we can use. There's some hidden registers you can't see or use directly. Um, some of these registers have special meaning. So register zero is used as the return code when either we call a kernel function or when we actually exit our BPF program. The uh, value of register zero will be used as the exit value of our program and will be the uh, return value of um, functions we call such as uh, map lookup element. Um, fun uh, registers R1 to R5 are used for function arguments. Uh, these registers will be overwritten or may be overwritten when we call a kernel function. And registers six to nine um, are preserved across function calls. So we can store a value in those, call a function, and, and it will be the same when that function returns. If you run out of registers, then you have to um, put values on the stack instead. Of course, this limits any function calls to five arguments. But generally speaking, you don't want more than five arguments in a function call anyway. You want to use a uh, structure. Um, and R10, register 10 is the stack frame pointer, which points to the top or the bottom of the stack, depending on which way you think about it. Personally, I don't think about it. Okay, so all of this code here is basically setting up the arguments for a function call. So the first argument of map lookup element is the file descriptor of the map. And then the second call is a memory location where we want the value from the map to be stored. Ah, no, I, sorry, I stand corrected. That's not <laughs> that's not what it is. I've actually forgotten. 